Paul, good to see you. Very good to see you too. So we will um, we'll start the session. It's uh, just on the hour. And so welcome to the fifth annual Creativity in Quarter Conference. And I can see that several of you on this call today have been part of the conference for at least four years. I know, Peter, certainly you have. And um, Michelle, I believe you've been part of at least three, if not four. Um, so my name is Dr. Josephine Myhill, and I started these conferences five years ago as part of my research into creativity. I've been researching creativity since about 2012 officially, so that's about eight, eight or nine years. So I'm so enthusiastic, I'm so passionate about the fact that you have been constant companions in these yearly conversations for, for so long. So let me start with you, Pete, because I know you quite well now, and um, maybe some of the others haven't met you already. So if you could just start by briefly introducing yourself. Yeah, hi everyone, great to be here. So I'm the co-founder of The Mind Takeaway, and <laughs> I have two podcasts, and you, I guess you could call me a creativity and leadership coach. Okay, and um, Michelle? I founded the Center for Creative Emergence about 22 years ago and have done um, all kinds of applied creativity, applied imagination events um, for the last 20 years. And I use whole brain integrative practices and principles in my training, coaching and facilitation. Thanks, Michelle. And Danny Lou, I know you've been a constant companion for many years. Is it three or four? I'm not sure. But if you could introduce yourself, Danny Lou. I will do, yeah. So very, very similar to Pete, actually. So I'm a leadership and creativity coach and consultant, but I'm also a freelance creative. So I engage in the creative arts as well. So I, I balance those two things. Okay, brilliant. And Dee, I know I've um, been speaking to you for at least a couple of years now, haven't I? Yeah, yeah. I'm Dee Manning. I'm my day job. I'm a community networker where I engage across several wards, communities to be involved socially, physically and psychologically with social activism, environmental issues and physical activity. And professionally, I'm a, an artist. Brilliant. And Janet, I had the privilege of meeting you for the first time this year. So if you could introduce yourself to the rest. Your microphone is on. Janet, now it's turned off. I'm sorry, did you say you wanted me to speak? If you could please introduce yourself briefly, because I know I've had a, an individual conversation with you, but the others, perhaps they haven't had a chance to, to meet you yet, I'm not sure. Well, actually we met <laughs> through LinkedIn <laughs> uh, briefly <laughs> before today. I'm Dr. Jenna Smith Warfield. I've had a very challenging and very interesting life. I am the founder of Planetary Peace, Power, and Prosperity Legacy Foundation, Inc. And what I have hold of is a semantic solution to all the human created suffering on this planet. Okay. Through create creativity co-creativity and manifestation okay brilliant thank you well my role in this panel discussion today will simply be to make sure that the discussion is flowing and to make sure everyone's had a fair opportunity to speak and to present their ideas and also i'll be keeping a check on the time the discussion will last approximately one hour and it would be very helpful for me if you could raise your hand when you're ready to speak, because that will, where you see reactions at the bottom of the menu, um, if you click on reactions, there is the, the emoticon for raising the hand. So if I see your hand raised, then I'll know you're ready to say something rather than calling on people cold. So with my individual conversations with each of you, we've spoken about the creative, power of stories and we all, we're all in agreement. There's no one that disagrees that stories are not powerful, that they're not influential. So my first question is simply, well, what is it that makes stories so powerful? 
you know, why are we so influenced by stories rather than, you know, facts, but for, for example, who would like to start off on that? We know that stories have, um, you know, many purposes. So stories can be for the purpose of teaching, they can be for the purpose of entertainment, they can be for the purpose of persuading people that they need to buy something. We know, you know, that's kind of common sense. We know that stories are used in all these different ways, but there are underlying hidden agendas or purposes that we may not be conscious of. What about those? Dee, do you have some something to comment on about that? Yeah, um, for me, with the work that I do, stories are, are very powerful because they give the listener insight into a lived experience and they could empower somebody or give somebody the confidence to want to engage in something or learn something or experience something new. With the communities that I work, work with, we use stories to, to motivate and inspire people because we, people are so caught up with all the challenges of everyday life, especially over the last two years. When they hear an inspirational story from someone's lived experience, it, it will click, it will enable something within that person to think, you know what, I want, you know, I want to step out of my front door today and try something new or have a voice about an issue that's affecting my community or my neighbour or, you know, they may be feeling a little insecure or lost at the moment and by hearing somebody that has, you know, maneuvered their way through depression or through a crisis you know that will that will give somebody the tools um you know to to take a step and make a difference for themselves and others mm, yeah that reminds me of somebody said this it, it, it may have been in one of the conversations I had with the participants for this conference but they said stories can be like mirrors or they can be like windows so what you're talking about, Dee, it's like we can use other people's stories as a mirror to reflect and, and perhaps see our own situation in a different light. Um, Michelle, you have something to say? Right, and to add on to what Dee was saying, um, you can find yourself in other people's stories and then you don't feel so isolated or you can find something. And I would just say uh, stories are a way of connect connecting isolated bits of data or facts and uh, when you connect them and weave them together, they can emerge a new meaning. They create meaning. And so data or facts alone might not have a lot of meaning until they're in a context. And then when you take, when you step back, uh, stories create a larger playing field for which to look at the context. And so you can uh, find meaning in them. And they're also a way to generate context. So sometimes, if you just start telling a story, the story can almost begin to tell more of itself. And so it's, you're telling a story, the story comes through you, you're adding to it. And so you're almost co-creating with an emergence that's happening in the moment. And story allows that versus just writing down bits of data. Yeah, Michelle, your work in emergence is so kind of, um, it's your position very well to, to um, to talk about emergence being something that adds value. So it's when uh, emergence doesn't occur in isolation, it occurs when we see these patterns and connections and something is created that was, it's almost as though we're creating something from nothing. You know, this is what creators often say that we create something from nothing. And what is that nothing? Nothing is that space in which emergence takes place. Um, Danny Lou, you have something to say? Yeah, I want to say about story that I it really gives us that sense of what's possible as well. We can get really entrenched in it, our own stories, and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's not such a good thing. But when we hear the stories of others or we hear a story about, well, how might this be? It really opens up those horizons about what's possible. And in doing so, it creates that stronger sense of community. It overall raises our empathy as well. Our EQ goes up because we hear a story and we're able to relate from another perspective. Um, 
And I think it can get us away from being stuck as a, as a society, as a community, it can get us out of stuckness. So that, that what's possible that story creates and that way that it can move us out of something that we might be entrenched in without realizing is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I, I really resonate with everything that's been said and it just reminded me in the work that I do and actually just all of us as humans, it's easier to, as, you, as we talked about before, you can see a mirror in yourself when you hear a story. So in the work that I do, if I'm helping a leader, for example, I can share research and interesting anecdotes, but actually when it comes from my lived shared experience, actually the people I'm trying to help, they're like, yeah, okay, I get that. Because then they start to, you know, in terms of neuroscience, it's just been proven of late as well, that when you hear a story that you can connect with, put a mirror up to, and you can see yourself in it, you're more likely than your brain's taking that in. And it's already building a map of that and actually playing that story as if you'd actually gone through that experience yourself. And for me, that's where impact's been. Even when I can't see things and someone shares an interesting story of adversity, it's much easier for me to latch onto that and find something useful. Yeah. And in your coaching work, Pete, you know, there, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is that the, in a coaching relationship, we're actually co-creating. And the other school of thought is that, no, we have to be totally impartial and not behave as though we are mirrors, not kind of use our own experience, you know? So for, you, you know, so again, we talked about stories being either mirrors or windows. Um, as a coach, do you tend to use the, that paradigm of that you're being like a window, you know, or opening up windows for your client, or do you behave as though you're a mirror for them to reflect in? I think there's a bit of both, but again, it's it's really down to your level of awareness. And I always say to the, pe the person I'm working with, for me, it's a journey of exploration and creativity. So I always say, if I'm sharing something, the, the caveat is this is coming from my lived experience. So, what I'm suggesting is if, if there's some use in this and I can see that there's been some value and then there's been a shift for that particular person I'm working with, then I'll always say to them, get curious, get creative, go out and experience that for yourself and then come back maybe in a week or a couple of weeks and tell me how it went. And that's usually more useful because yeah, there is something in terms of psychology called transference, right? And I have to be careful of that quite often. And I'll put my hand up, it does happen pretty much in every session so you've just got to be careful that like you're not trying to shift people in you know towards your perspective rather than actually allowing them to find their way forward yeah and every story has a language and janet you are very much involved with semantics and the language of a story can um if I tell a story to you in Punjabi, it might not mean very much because that language is not familiar to you. So we have to tell stories in a in language that is familiar to the recipient, right? Janet? It's so, you may have figured out I'm a total logistical idiot here. <laughs> I, just, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. They changed the rules since the last time I was on Zoom. But um, yeah, I... I I'm sorry. At the bottom of the screen, you have three little dots which say more. You click on the three little dots which say more, and it says reactions. And under when you click on reactions, the the the, um, the symbol for race ah, there. your system works different differently from my system. Okay, I see that now. Thank you very much for the the education. I, getting back to the focus of stories. It's so interesting to me. As a child, I heard lots of stories. Um, Alice in Wonderland, for example, or The Ugly Duckling. And I was just hearing those stories from other people, from the outside. So I was kind of separated from the story because I had not yet lived that story. And then uh, I'm, I'm now 85 years old. I've lived a lot of stories. And as Peter was saying, have actually been in the personal experience. And the story suddenly 
has deeper meaning once you actually live one of those archetypal patterns and they are patterns. And sometimes we can get very stuck in the archetypal patterns. <laughs> you know, is there anyone uh, on the panel that has had an experience of this? Because I, I know like, in my own role, I've been an educator most of my life, and I seem to be stuck in that archetypal sage, you know, continuously learning, continuously um, not kind of like focusing on wider themes for example the archetype of the the joker for example doesn't come naturally to me and I think that we can become so kind of in enclosed in a particular archetype at the um at the loss of other opportunities in life has anyone else experienced that with their story so Danny Lou go ahead yeah no definitely I I we talked about this I think in the in the conversation that you and I had about the archetype of the warrior which has served me hugely, you know, I'm a warrior, I can deal with this, I can deal with this. But of course, as you rightly say, getting stuck in that cuts off other opportunities. And what it means is, where's the person who receives? Where's the person who rests? And then that limits experience. So we, we have a lens that we view our own story through if we get entrenched in archetype. I think it's important to step back and realize that there are many lenses and it's a choice. And also, uh, who are we in the story? Are we um, the protagonist? Are we the villain? Are we, um, you know, an extra? Are we, you know, a pawn in the story? Like, who are we in these stories? Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Well, to add to that, I think, yes, we can definitely get stuck in our own pattern archetypes or any kind of the patterns. So one of the beautiful things about creativity and applying it is, we can create new patterns to live into. So we ourselves may not know um, archetypes that are less familiar to us, but uh, through a the theatrical role play or an improv or, or a storytelling, we can imagine, we enter our creative imagination. We, start, uh, we can start imagining what would it be like to be the here with a different kind of archetypal energy available to us what would it what would it be like from this kind of archetypes point of view or that kind of archetypes point of view and I think eventually we can um sort of mine the wisdom of that archetype and then we can begin to live into it and so story can be one of the gateways the windows doors vehicles to start to learn explore discover what an archetype could look like live into it and then be able to call that in into the design or the delivery of whatever it is we're creating. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, okay, Valerie, I see that you have your hand raised, but I'm, I don't know if your webcam is on. Yeah, I've tried. I apologize to you all. For some reason, there's a problem with my connection with my laptop and it's not, not allowing me to link to my camera. So I really apologize because I can see all your lovely faces and yet you can't see mine. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I would still like to partake in that particular question where you said about, from what I remember, who are you with, with the storytelling? And many times I find that when I'm connecting with a new person that I don't know, um, by talking about something else or someone else's story, relating to what that first person is speaking to me about, that's a really good way to connect because depending on how um, shy a person you are, your personality traits, you know, you know, whether or not you're an extrovert or an introvert, bringing in someone else's story can be a wonderful door opener because it shows that you're still able to communicate and engage with that first contact without the person that you're speaking about being there. <laughs> but the communication is being acknowledged, heard and understood. So yeah, it depends on the context of what and where you're talking about. And when we change these contexts, so for example, Pete, I know that you li you've lived and traveled in lots of different countries and, and it, the context changes our story, doesn't it? Yeah, I think we talked about this in our last conversation, Jesper, that, Whenever I lived in another country from the one I grew up in, 
My whole perspective shifts, of course. And, you know, people have different culture. There's a different narrative in everywhere I've traveled to. But it wasn't until I actually lived in a place for, you know, more than six months a year or even a decade, in some cases, like where I am now, that things started to shift. And I could see that the, the narrative changes completely. It's always fluid. And actually, the one of the best gifts I give to myself and my clients is saying to them, look, there's no fixed story. I know that you're probably telling yourself stuff that you may or may not be aware of. But what if it actually can shift moment to moment? You know, it depends on your mood. I mean, the latest research I was looking at the other day was that words can completely change, you know, our psychology, but they also have a physical impact because the parts of the brain that are connected to language also impact the physical part of our body as well. So obviously if we're telling ourselves something like, you know, we're not good enough or we're an imposter, et cetera, then it all, you know, it, it gets quite challenging to kind of navigate further through that because you just can't see a future that's more positive, right? Yeah, and that reminds me um, of something I heard which made a lot of sense. It's that um, the, the statement I'm thinking of is somebody said, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. <laughs> well, stories are always subject to interpretation. A story that I tell you now will will be interpreted differently in this context and it will be interpreted differently in say 50 years time or it, it may have been interpreted very differently in the past and so so stories are malleable they they change whereas facts people argue about uh, facts being um i suppose you know not subject to interpretation that's that's very often one of those paradigm wars of like well is this just a story or is it fact? You know, so Janet, what do you think about that, you know, with your academic background as well? You know, because I know in academia, we're constantly having to um, prove that storytelling is a great way to do research, for example, rather than simply experimentation with objective variables that we, we, we change. Well, is... <clears throat> It's very interesting. I, I practiced law for 22 years and everyone, of course, has his or her own story when you're in a trial. And the role of the attorney is to ask the questions and bring out specific focuses or aspects of that story, which ultimately put together a pattern that all seems to make sense and fit together. So you can't really call it truth, or maybe you can't really call it fact, but when all the different stories come together in an integrated pattern, the jury then can decide what really happened here as well as they are able and none of us is perfect uh, <laughs> it's 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 a constant playing of a game and something else i wanted to say that is why ultimately you keep your head in the present moment because you do not know what is going to suddenly appear within the context of your own experience but if you understand, if you've lived the archetypes, you can play any role. I, I call myself a word energy alchemist. I see Peter nodding his head because in any context or any situation, I can frequently, I think almost always shift this power over or power against dynamic into a power with dynamic, which is not solid and fixed. It's constantly creative and co-creative and manifesting in each and every moment. And it's exciting. It's a really fun, interesting place in which to play. That, yeah, it's interesting that as a lawyer, you are trying to create the strongest story in defending somebody. And, and sometimes um, there's a piece of evidence that will come to light maybe 10 years down the line that will ch totally change the story that was uh, created previously. 
In other situations, so for example, in science, we have stories as well, stories of what um, will create a healthy lifestyle. And then we find another fact that will totally um, undermine what the, the story. Um, what I'm talking about here is when I was growing up, the story was that eggs are bad for you. And then the story <laughs> changed and it's like, no, egg, eggs are good for you. It's like go to work on, on an egg. And so that's a simple example of how one, you know, um, some food can, based on the narratives around it, can, can become uh, our friend or can become like something to, to be avoided. Does anybody else have any other examples of stories that have shifted our own paradigms and how we behave? I know butter was an, another example of like, there were stories around butter being bad. And then there are stories with the keto diet that no fat um, is actually good for us and it's carbohydrates that are bad. And so those are other stories that are shifting and go ahead, Janet. Well, these are, these are generalizations. And generalizations always have their exceptions. So it depends on what's going on in your own unique body and what that unique body happens to need at a particular time. <laughs> we kind of walk along trying to figure out what's true and what's not true and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But we need to get that word should out of our vocabulary and ask different questions like, what do I think? What do I feel? What do I need? What are my choices? What do I need to know? Whom can I trust in each and every moment? So you're always protecting your own energy field, your own soul, but you're also playing with other people at the same time. And you're, you're, it's, it's almost like a game and it's very challenging and very fun. Yeah. Nobody knows where it's ultimately going to end. But if we keep the, that intention of power with and, and mutual respect and accountability, and, and there are other, a lot of other values in here, we can hold the dance and then we dance our own part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Danny? Danny Lou? I was going to say, as a build to that, it's interesting to me that, it, you know, we have the meaning we make of our own story or the meaning we make of someone else's story really can affect how we feel in relation to that. And that's a very changeable thing, moment to moment to moment to moment. So that um, what is the truth of a story is always the question, what's the truth of it in any given moment? It, it makes me think about, I directed a production of The House of Bernarda Alba in June. And, you know, in the rehearsal room with that, for example, you know, looking at a particular scene and the meaning that all of the actors I was working with would make of that one little scene was so diverse. So the story that we, the meaning we make as a personal thing or the meaning we make as a collective can be very, very different things. There's different energies attached to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, I know that book. And so when we're thinking about stories like that, that include the supernatural, that include things that we that are not tangible, they, they're even more subject to interpretation, they become even more complex. And, um, and it's, it's um, we will interpret them entirely based on our own values and experiences. Dee, go ahead. Um, I was thinking of an instance where with the work I do, part of it is getting people to be engaged in physical activity. And one of the activities that we wanted to put on was yoga, but there were some community groups who had been told that yoga was religious. So because of their religion, they should not partake in that activity. So, and because I couldn't understand why the women wouldn't, because they'd come to me and say, I would love to do it, but it's against my religion. And I'd say, how can yoga be against your religion? And it wasn't until I had conversations with the women that I discovered why the meaning behind it and how from generation after generation within their culture, they, they were told this. So then I, had to then I had to explain with facts the benefits of yoga and that 
it was not a religion. It was a physical, mental and psychological, you know, tool that you can use that will improve your well-being and your mental health. And then having to then bring their partners and talk to their partners and explain it is not a religion. This is something that will benefit your wives, your daughters, your nieces. So then having to break their myth, break that story and enabling them to trust me enough, you know, so that they would accept this. So again, it's all about perceptions and stereotypes and, you know, tales that have been passed down that have then been made solid in stone. And, and until someone breaks that with some fact, then they have to open their minds and decide for themselves, well, is what she's telling me the truth or is what I've learned through my whole life, my whole childhood, through my culture, through my cultural group, from my parents, you know, who's, who's telling the truth? And then that then gives them the tool to then go and discover for themselves. So I'm informing them with some information for them to then make a choice. Do I research that or do I dismiss it? Well, the thing is, you see, Dee, yoga has been part of Hinduism for thousands of years. That's the roots of yoga. So when we look at yoga in its context, it is part and parcel of the religion of Hinduism. And so what you're doing is extracting that, just the facts around it, the physical exercise, which is secular, which is not religious. And so um, this is you know, an ideal example of like, uh, sometimes we need to separate the facts from the story because the story has all the associations, whereas the facts the, um, isolated from the story, they, they're they not associated. So you're both right. You're right in that it's not part of religion, but they're also right that it is because for centuries it has been part and parcel of, of a religion. And so, um, but, you know, it's extracting that fact from its, its context that can be problematic. Okay, um, Michelle, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, uh, to add on to that, I think stories become limiting when they become static or rigid or one right way, or uh, the interpretations aren't seen as interpretations, but the exact truth and this is the one right way, or they become very rigid. And so uh, to that point about if you can expand out to see a yes and or a both and or and expand it out into what uh, there were so many points people brought up but one the lived embodied experience of how does how do my how does my own perception and my own stories and my own life check with this story and also being open that in any given time any story doesn't contain the whole truth in the way that we perceive it at that moment, that there's always room for it to move, grow, expand, that there may be um, truths within it, but it's not the whole truth. And so how can we expand it into a larger frame? I, I work a lot with fr expanding the frames and yes, anding through you know, improv theater or somatics, you know, moving in the body. And one way I think <clears throat> that can help people move through or check into what kind of stories, where am I stuck in a certain story? And this might be our own personal story about ourselves. Who am I and my own limitations or what something I was told that I took in and believed. There are ways that they actually lodge in the body. These, these rigid belief systems can lodge in the body. So when we begin to move differently and break our movement patterns and move non-habitually or move our bodies in different ways, it is amazing. It actually creates new neural pathways in the brain that new stories or an expanded story or a different way of seeing, being and perceiving what happened can emerge. So I'm a huge advocate of not just the verbal stories or oral stories, but also the somatic <laughs> stories, the visual stories, using all of our brains and senses to inhabit more expanded and novel stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, for example, dance, you know, um, dance tells a story, doesn't it? And, and, and again, it's to do with what we associate that story to be. And another example is um, going back to Dee's point earlier about yoga and 
and Janet's point earlier about the importance of language that we use, it's like the word yoga, it's, it comes, it has connotations, it's associated with a particular religion, in the same way that meditation is linked with a particular religions, more than one, but people in a secular society prefer to call it mindfulness because mindfulness seems to be not associated with Buddhism or Hinduism. And so that's another example of how we create stories around words, you know, like yoga, uh, meditation. We, we, you know, we can kind of like envisage the kind of person who would be engaged in yoga. We have stories around it, you know, whereas if we look at those words in isolation, simply the facts around them, you know, maybe it's um, it's not to do with a religion, it's simply to do with exercise, it's simply to do a way of thinking. Go ahead, Janet. Oh, can I just... Sorry, can I just make a quick point? Sorry, Janet, can I just chip <laughs> in first? Apologies. I just wanted to speak about what Dee mentioned about the yoga. Um, explaining to those, I believe there are many ladies that maybe wanted to do the yoga and, and Jezvia's response to that. I, I think that that's a brilliant um, example of your question, um, Jezvia, where you mentioned about how do we distinguish between stories that are designed to manipulate and those that are designed to inspire. That was a classic example because those ladies were so conditioned that even probably the word yoga was such a no-no. It seemed like in their heart, they wanted to do it. They wanted to take part and be part of a group that were going through that whole experience within that moment and maybe thereafter. But through the conditioning and being told no and limit, having to limit their behavior, it's a restriction. So they weren't even able to have an experience for them to say, wow, I actually love this. It went against my usual beliefs, i.e. what I've been conditioned to believe how I've grown up. But look, I really enjoyed it. So that in itself was an inspiration. And it actually makes me wonder, after your conversation with them, with, where you explained your standpoint of that whole situation, how many of them actually went ahead and did the yoga, as opposed to those that maybe continue to think about it. Can you, can you answer? Yes, can I answer? Yeah, can you answer? Yeah. Did, did anyone and, go what happened, and what happened was I had to speak to the husbands and then we hired the venue and then it was because it was a woman's only session. So the husbands brought their wives, their wives had to stay in the car and their husbands came in and they looked at the space and I spoke to them. And I took them round, I said, have you got any questions? And none of them had a question. They just stood and looked. They looked at me and smiled. They walked out and then they brought their wives in and then they left. So from what I said to them, they must have trusted me because it's a safe space for women to, because it wasn't just about yoga. We did yoga and then there was tea and a chat. Yeah. So, it was about creating a safe space. It was about them doing physical activity because a lot of the women that came, the majority of them had, were suffering from depression, anxiety, isolation. You know, so for them to have a safe space for two hours where they could do yoga, meditation, and then communicate with other women, mm. to have that support network was so powerful. They were, exactly. so for, yeah, for, so for, for the whole year, yeah, they were able to come into that safe space and be able to communicate their feelings, their emotions, their fears, their anxieties with other women in a safe place where they knew they wouldn't be chastised or, you know, they wouldn't, you know, experience physical abuse or have a negative, you know, reflect reaction to it. So, and then it was an educate in a way, it was educating their husband and, and the men of the family Exactly. It, is, it is okay for the females within your family to participate in physical exercise and to communicate with women outside of their community. It's interesting, though, that they needed their husbands slash that male initial approval 
in order to take that next step and experience something that just, you know, inspired them so much and probably even changed their lives and opened mm -hmm. their minds. But they needed that initial approval. That's the interesting part. Yeah, yeah. So for the women that whose husbands and partners didn't give, give their approval, they didn't experience it. Mm. But I'm hoping that the women that did, that did attend could then go out and provide that security of knowledge to women, other women within their community. And it has worked because now then women have engaged in other activities like cycling or going for walks or being involved in art sessions or cook along sessions, you know, things that never before they would have been involved in. And it's, and it's just so wonderful, you know, just, just to see their, their body language change, the, the smile, see their confidence grow week after week. So that, that initial, you know, story that no, you can't participate with this activity because it's against your culture, it's against your religion. I blew that myth away for them because someone trusted me, their partners trusted me, their husbands trusted me. And even for the men, that was a big step for them to trust me. Mm. You know, so yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So that is a good example of, of a story being shifted, um, a cross-cultural story, you know, because we're talking here about stories that are embedded in our cultures and very distinct values. So go ahead, Janet. I know you've got your hand up. <laughs> I, there are two things that I think can explain why we have these conflicts. One is if you go... If you look at Buddhism, for example, one of the famous sayings from Buddhism is that words are fingers pointing at the moon. They are not the moon. So there's a distinction between, and, and let me bring in here too, Alfred Korzybski, the Polish semanticist, <clears throat> uh, who said, he's famous for the saying, the map is not the territory. And I like to elaborate on that. The words are not the experience. The menu is not the food you eat. Driving north along the west coast of Florida on Route I-75 is not the same as focusing on the beautiful bougainvillea and the palm trees sway and the Gulf breeze waters. So you can choose your focus and just be aware that we fight over the maps and we want our map, our human created map to be the truth. Well, it's not. It's a perspective or it is a guide or it can be either a support system or a prison depending on your own personal needs. And nobody can evaluate that for another person except that other person. But each of us can evaluate for ourselves and choose how we're gonna show up in each and every moment. Yeah, I like that, um, that phrase, uh, you know, in the NLP world, it's used very often, the map is not the territory. Again, this is to do with like, facts changing shifting all the time like countries being divided um if we look back at maps of um the world like 100 years ago even you know everything looked different in terms of our identity like are we you know talk about yugoslavia you know it used to be one country and now it's four different countries and how does that shift our identity simply because of where the border is drawn um peter lives in germany that used to be two countries divided by a wall and now it's one country how does that shift our stories our identities like all those years that were spent divided by a wall have they left their mark have they left scars um Pete, do you want to say something about that? What's it like for you living in a country that used to be divided and now it isn't? It's fascinating. I love living in Germany. Uh, but the more I learn about the history and the deeper I go, the more it's ingrained into the psyche of 
every human, but it's not just in Germany. The more curious I got, you know, because everyone knows a little bit about that history. But I, I was actually quite, um, what's the right word? <laughs> Lost for words. I think I had the privilege of speaking to some people who had actually been locked up and tortured. Uh, yeah, it was quite harrowing. So I, I was actually took around the prison. It's, luckily, it's not a prison anymore. But when I learned about all of the stuff that was going on in secret, I was like, wow, how could you not carry that forward into everything that you do? But again, for me, I mean, we touched on this, but it, it all goes back to awareness and really a willingness and curiosity to look at your own blind spots and unconscious biases. And, and I think I've been privileged to live in you know a few different countries now. And what the biggest learning I'd always take away from it is that, wow, I'm always still got stuff in my lived experience from the past, from growing up in the UK, from some of the trauma that I went through. And just to give you a side thing as well, my partner grew up in the war of Yugoslavia, actually the, some of the worst fighting. So over the years, I've, I've seen how she's unlearning a lot of the labels and a lot of the things that came up for her. And, and quite interestingly, some of the narratives around I'm not enough because she was a refugee and stuff like this. So it's amazing how powerful stories are for positive, you know, I'm a musician as well. So for creative energy and the story that you can say, OK, let's take uh, these people on a creative journey and have fun and see where it goes. But on the offshoots of that, you know, looking at the news for 10 minutes can send you spinning because of all the conflict and people who are displaced and climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're talking about like looking at the news, it's like which stories are included, which stories are considered to be newsworthy and which are not. So go ahead, Danny, you have something to say. Yeah, um, it inspired both well by everyone's conversation. Michelle unlocked this with me when she was talking about the somatic work. And then, Peter, you unlocked it again, talking about trauma and something that's really fascinating me at the moment, because I'm doing my own work on this, I guess, is the stories that our body holds. You know, our body holds the st stories that we're not even conscious of yet. And how do we tune into those? How do we how do we listen to those? How do they inform us? And how, you know, because they're very wise, these stories that our bodies hold. And I feel like that's as amazing as the neuroscience is. And it's, you know, we don't want to lose that, but there's a yes and here, right, <laughs> Michelle, for your impro stuff. Like the yes and is, yes and what does the body tell us? And that's something that is really interesting to me around story. Absolutely. It's absolutely fascinating. And Danny, I'm, uh, Danny Lou, I'm looking back, I'm thinking about the conversation that we had about the stories that are, that are carried through in our DNA. And as you say, we're not even aware of them. You know? no. So um, when you found out something about your family, it kind of shifted your perception because you could perhaps, you had felt that in your DNA, but you weren't aware of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, when I found out that my, my father was adopted, and we always were like, well, we're really dark. Where are we from? Where are we from? Me and my sisters, you know, we're, hmm. and uh, not, you know, we felt like there was a little more than just the northeast of England going on. And then discovered that my father's mother, his birth mother was Indian. And now we have all this family in India that we're now connected with, thankfully, down to social media. But yeah, hugely shifted the sense of who I was in a, in a really profound way. And yeah, I guess all of these stories we carry in our DNA is fascinating and very complex mm -hmm. yeah and I think most of us we we focus on the positive aspects of stories but there is also the dark side of stories and um, when we look at wars a lot of wars are created through stories as well you know stories of who the enemy is mm -hmm. and you know I don't want to put Pete back on the spot again because again I think about Nazi Germany that was that happened because there was a very powerful story going on about who the enemy was and Yugoslavia would have been the same you know there were stories of like who the enemy was and you know the the kind of deep story about survival that if we don't attack we will die you know so ultimately like these stories of survival can lead to something very negative as well as very positive. Janet, go ahead. Well, Peter, I actually spent a summer living in Spandau in, oh, okay. uh, in 1953 as an American field service exchange student. That was a wake up call because of Spandau, Berlin. 
To get to Berlin, we had to take a United States troop train from Frankfurt to Berlin because we had to go through East Germany, which at that point was considered an enemy. We had these dark drapes over our window. We traveled at night. And uh, I, I was 16 at the time. I was curious. We were told not to open those drapes. Well, about 6 a.m. in the morning, the train stopped. I was curious. I was <laughs> 16 years old. I want to see where we are and what's going on. I pulled the drapes aside <clears throat> just a tiny little bit. We were in Potsdam. And the whole platform was filled with armed soldiers. I quickly closed those drapes again and understood why I had been told not to open the drapes. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, it's um, okay, Michelle. I know you've had, you have your hand raised. Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, yeah, well, I think it ties in to some of the other <coughs> One of the most powerful things I've noticed a, a theme in my work over the last couple decades is um, around creativity and how people navigate it and around emergence and their creative imagination is the story they carry about what the unknown is. Is the unknown a place to be feared? Is, does the unknown create, hold danger? Does the unknown hold something? Uh, and so people will cling to certainty. They'll cling to the need to be right, N often not out of anything malevolent or negative within them, but just because the, there is a fear of the unknown. Or is the unknown a place to create, to discover, to uh, step into to, for new possibilities? And so if somebody holds a store, um, a life-giving generative story about what the unknown is, they are often more likely to step into exploration and discovery with more ease than if they think it's a terrifying place. And so part of it is it, when we shift the relationship to uncertainty, ambiguity, the unknown, and we don't make it um, a negative thing and it becomes the more of an invitation to imagine, create and discover. I think that is part of it. And part of it's because that's also embedded in our social structure. We get accolades for what we know. We often don't get accolades if you would step up to uh, a lectern and say, okay, let's explore. You know, if you step in as the beginner, as the explorer. And so part of it is there's is systemic in our belief about what the unknown is and how to navigate it and the stories we have on that. Yeah, and I suppose some of the most powerful stories are the ones that inspire us to think about, you know, that raise questions. We we call these inspirational stories because they've they've um, made us question what we know, and we start to ask very good questions about the things that we don't know. So as it's coming up to five to the hour, maybe let's talk about this. Let's talk about the unknown. You know, is it? Um, I prefer to think about the unknown in a positive light, but I know that the unknown also entails risks and dangers, you know, which um, it would be foolish to, uh, to ignore the possibilities. I mean, the pandemic, you know, it's changed everyone's lives around the world, but people were not, um, you know, the leaders are being accused of not having foreseen this, you know, not having foreseen these dangers. So it was these unknowns. So the unknown is not simply all positive, it's also negative as well. Go ahead, Janet, I can see you have your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the unknown is what the Buddhists call beginner's mind. So you know you don't know. But because you know, you don't know, you know all these um, <laughs> people wearing masks of really knowing and being able to tell you how to live your life. They don't know either. It's a, an archetype, it's a facade. You go back to the story of Alice in Wonderland, 
where they finally got up to the wizard and somebody went ripped, <laughs> and I'm speaking from memory, ripped the, the curtain off from the face of the wizard. The wizard standing behind there pulling all these cords and manipulating everything. And suddenly, and it's like Hans Christian Andersen, um, the emperor has no clothes. It's a kid who's saying that. All the adults believe this man is powerful. Yeah. It all depends on how each of us wants to frame our own experiences. And each of us is in choice in each and every moment. You can tell yourself, maybe because you've been told by other people, that you're stupid, incompetent, you can't do anything, you're a mess. Or you can start using affirmations. This is a conscious choice of the use of language. I am powerful. I am beautiful. I can manifest anything that I choose to manifest. You start saying these words over and over again. I don't know whether anybody can feel the difference in the energy behind those words. But if I keep telling myself, I am, I am a creator. Now, what would I like to create right here, right now? Yeah, thanks, Janet. Pete, go ahead. Yeah, I love this conversation, so thank you. I mean, just a reminder, we create our reality moment to moment. And just to your point, Jesva, I know that in hindsight, it, I mean, I'm guilty of it as well. We all blame governments and individuals and pharmaceutical companies for, you know, all of the pandemic, et cetera. But let's be honest, we don't know what's going to happen in the next few minutes, let alone six months, a year. And I've worked, you know, 20 years in corporate life amongst having a music career. What I learned was these companies spend billions on trying to predict, you know, prediction machines, AI, automation. It's all great technology. But let's be honest, we just don't know what's around the corner. And in the work that I do, you know, whether it's creative work or working with a leader, I'm like, well, let's prepare for opportunity. I don't know. You don't know. And I don't know about any of you on this call now, but I'm terrible. My crystal ball is rubbish. You know, if I get if I'm not in a place of clarity and I don't know what's going on, I can create, you know, both positive and really scary outcomes that may or may not happen. But when I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to get on with it and let's prepare for opportunity so my best guess is i would like this to happen however quite often i'm actually amazed and excited especially in the work that i do on in music and stuff like that when i'm just i've got nothing on it and i know that you've got to plan and you've got to have structure and you do have to have strategy in the world of business right but quite often the wheels come off when people put a tight structure around it so yeah i just love this because it segues so well into the narrative, because it is a narrative, even predicting it's, it's all a story, right? Yeah, it's very fascinating. Yeah, you've reminded me, Pete, of, you know, like people always use this, uh, well, they, they often use that um, that thing about the glass, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? And I like yeah. it when they say, well, it's both half empty and both half, it's half full and, and half empty. <laughs> Maybe Michelle, you you might relate to that. Go ahead, Michelle, I see your hand raised. Oh, okay, yeah, just to say that um, part of, uh, in improv, one of the um, tenets is you're preparing to be adaptive or you're preparing to be spontaneous <laughs> to build on what Peter just said, you know, um, that there's no way to know really what is going to happen in the unknown. But if you're more confident in your capacity to adapt, to be spontaneous, to pivot, to uh, create opportunities within it, then even if it isn't something that you po that you would consider positive or that you would want or you would look forward to, I think many of us have been, um, um, almost everyone's been impacted by the la events of the last couple of years. And so we're all, how do we adapt within it? And that might mean, how do we shift, um, some, for some people, how do you shift your work? How do you shift your way of navigating? How do you shift your way of being in the world? And I think being prepared to adapt makes it easier, even if the un, what the unknown presents isn't something that you would have wanted or positive, but the idea that you can adapt within it, you can shift the story, mm -hmm. your own personal story and, for, and those who it, you serve and for those whom you serve. Yeah. 
that makes sense. So it's about our own story in um, adaptation with everyone else's stories, you know, because, you know, you talk about creating our own reality and we create our own reality in conjunction with the reality of all everyone else. And so it's a very complex process. So it's not simply that we have total control over what's going to happen. We have as much control as an individual can have in a very complex world where there are more than 7 billion different realities going on. So, okay, so it's just come to, to the, the hour. This has been a fascinating discussion and I know that we've all got plenty more to say about the subject and let's hope that we can continue these conversations. We meet at seven o'clock and 10 o'clock every Saturday during the year in between these conferences. So whenever you are available, either at 10 o'clock or at seven o'clock on the Saturday evening, then just let me know. I'll send, I'll send out the links to take part in those, um, in those sessions. But thank you very much. Does anybody have anything else to say before we finish? Very, very, very um, briefly. Go ahead, Val. Yeah, I agree with um, what Janet mentioned about you don't know what you don't know and what Michelle said about basically um, being flexible. That, that's my take on it. And just being open to opportunities that are out there and if they fit in with your, for want of a better word, agenda, where there's mutual benefit, um, win-win all around, then just go with the flow, but knowing that there's an outcome that you would like like if there's an expectation that you'd like to meet see where you can make that happen on a win-win basis and just be flexible be creative and keep the other person in mind as well so that's for me as well as everybody else thank you janet go ahead i would just like to offer a simple rule for living which is do whatever you want as long as you do no harm and that's a generalization, so watch out for it. But it's a really simple, useful one. <laughs> okay. Um, I heard something the other day um, re relevant to what you've just said, Janet. Uh, somebody was saying that very often we get taught to do unto others as you would be done by, like treat others the way you want to be treated. And they said, it's a much better way to treat others the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated, but the way they want to be treated. That was, that was um, an interesting take on it, which made a lot of sense. Does anybody else have anything quick to share before we, we close? Okay, well, thank you very much. Hopefully I'll see you on one of the Saturday Mastermind sessions at either 10 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.